Activate your energy. Welcome to the Activated Authors Podcast, a show where we distill the core principles of what it takes to become a happy, healthy, and productive author, no matter what stage of the journey you're at. I'm your host, Daniel Wilcox. I'm an international best-selling author, as well as an author coach, speaker, and creative entrepreneur. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student of all things productivity, psychology, and human behavior. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. Without further ado, let's dive in. What is up, Activators? And welcome back to another episode of the Activated Authors Podcast with just myself today, Daniel Wilcox. This is going to be a bit of a, a break from the norm because um, as people have been following the show for the last few weeks know, life is a bit hectic at the minute. Uh, Sam's not feeling all that well. And at the same time, it's been summer holidays with the little one. So last week was a very uh, interrupted schedule, which has meant that we haven't been able to record our typical interview, dialogue, all the fun uh, kind of podcast. But what I figured, since we weren't able to get to that full podcast, um, is that I would reshare an interview that still remains to this day one of the most influential, one of the most fun, uh, and one of the interviews that I'm I've been most proudest of that I've done in my career over the last, what are we on, nine years of authoring and podcasting and stuff. And that is the interview with the incredible Josh Malaman. Now, this interview I recorded at the end of November uh, 2020, which was the year that nothing happened, as we can recall. And uh, I will say this was probably, uh, as you work through the game as an interviewer, you start with small smaller authors and i don't mean that disingenuously just people you know you, you kind of reach out to the people that you think you can get uh, and this is my first kind of big lunge at the big time and josh malaman is not only an incredible human being he's an amazing author uh, his works have been translated into netflix films such as bird box uh, he's had bram stoker award-winning books all over the place he's written books such as goblin such as mallory uh, and he's someone that i massively look up to and this interview particularly sticks with me just because we don't really go into his books but we go into what it is to be an artist what it is to be an author and just the mentality behind production and creation and this wonderful thing that we call art and so i'm gonna say no more and i'm gonna pass over to past stan from nearly three years ago and give you what has to this day still been one of the most influential interviews of my life uh there will be a small wrap-up at the end and then we'll we'll call it quits and hopefully be back to regular recording next week uh, but yeah, there it is. Over to you, past Dan and past Josh Malaman. Let's go. Josh Malaman is a New York Times bestselling author and also one of two singer-songwriters for the rock band The High Strung, whose song The Luck You Got can be heard as the theme song to the Showtime show Shameless. His critically acclaimed novel, Bird Box, has been adapted into a Netflix feature film starring Sandra Bullock, John Malkovich and Sarah Paulson, and was also nominated for the Stoker Award, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the James Herbert Award. The sequel novel, Mallory, was released early this year to roaring success, and his books Black Mad Wheel and Goblin have also been nominated for Stoker Awards. Joshua Malaman, welcome to the show. Hello, that intro was amazing for me. I was like, it was like a reminder for me. I was like, oh yeah, wait, yeah, you, you do have a best-selling novel, and oh my God, you do have a movie made. Yeah, that was kind of, that was nice. Was it's like, gotta be, oh. yeah, it's, it's gotta be something that's so, I don't know, I'm trying to put myself in that position because obviously the, you, you do have a lot of credits behind your name. Like we listed the awards there. Obviously you've had things uh, translated into film. You kind of, you've got the band going as well. There's so much going on. And uh, I think the beginning of how I want this interview to start is very, very much digging into what the definition of an artist is because obviously you've got the band, you've got the, the books, you've got the sort of film ad adaptations. So let me ask you, what does it mean to you to be an artist in today's world? Wow, uh, I have never it's been a big asked. question to start with, I know. Uh, but my, one of my favorites, um, I've never been asked it, but one of my favorite subjects to discuss. The way I see it is, if you want to be an artist, you have to finish works of art. And this this is something that I came to uh, young enough where it was frustrating because I wasn't finishing. I was writing songs and that 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 definitely got me through it this period, but I wasn't finishing the novels that I was starting. So between the ages of like 19 to 29, I tried my hand at like four novels and failed. I put, I'm putting quotes around failed because all I really mean by failed is I didn't finish them. I didn't care if they were um, right or wrong or good or bad or long or short, whatever it was, I just didn't finish one. And somewhere in there, I started thinking, if you're gonna be an author, you have to actually write a book, buddy, you know? And it was a, it was a kind of a daunting realization. You're writing songs, okay, this is good. But that translates 
to me, that translates immediately over to what is an artist because, and I'm not even just talking about like the eye of the beholder or um, everything is objective, but there really is no right or wrong to it, right? And if you look on the spectrum, uh, let's, say you're, let's say you're setting out to write a novel and you're like, oh, am I good enough? Okay. And if you check out like the spectrum of what you've read, what you've experienced, and you go from like the absolute height, the pinnacle to the worst, and the, there's a th thousands of books between, I think it's safe to say that you feel like you would fit somewhere on that spectrum. So it would be incredible if you um, got beyond the, the pinnacle of what you think that is. And it would be maybe even more incredible if you fell below what you consider to be <laughs> the worst book you've ever read. So to me, you take all those people as artists, you take all those people as serious, they wrote novels, this guy's an author, this girl's a, a filmmaker, whatever it is. And so to me, then it literally just comes down to just writing it, just finishing one, just making a movie, just making an album, whatever it is. So as simple as that answer, and as long as that answer is, it really just comes down to an artist is so is someone who finishes works of art. I love that so much. And that resonates a lot because a lot of the authors that I speak to, nine times out of 10, they're people that have tried in the past but never quite reached the end. And one thing that I preach to a lot of people is, if you're looking to get into this kind of profession, there is nothing more powerful than writing the end on the first draft and knowing that you can finish because that is such a, a huge hurdle for people to even get to. The idea of writing however many pages of a work and hitting the end is just phenomenal. And for me, I don't really care what happens after that. I can I can put everything, every part of my journey down to me writing the end on that first that first novel. Could not agree more. So at the end of those four or at the end of those 10 years and the four failed novels. I had some crazy idea that I was gonna write two at once because <laughs> I figured, and one was a very lofty um, idea, which actually sounds appealing to me again now, but hasn't for a long time. And then the second idea was sort of this real psychosexual um, horror novel, real fast paced thing. And I sat down to, you know, the idea was real fast. The idea was you start one, if you get stuck in it, you turn to the other one, if you get stuck there, we turn back. So we can use, instead of getting stuck and then no, 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 never come <laughs> back to it, they, we, I can use these two ideas for each other, against each other, for each other. So I made it like two, literally two pages into the loftier idea. And I was like, ah, oh, shoot, I don't know what's going on. And I transferred over to the, to the, to the dirty one and just exploded through it like, like, something like what was it 91,000 words in 28 days wow um all handwritten and this was all in a an all-night coffee shop um in outside of Detroit and I would go at midnight and write till about 4 a.m it was winter it was December of um uh 2004 or something and I'll never forget when getting to a spot where I was like wait a minute I know how this ends and I'm near that spot. Like I was on page like 270 or something. And I had made it to 300 in one of the failed novels. Hmm. And I'm like, but wait a minute, I actually know that this stops at this scene that's coming up. Like, oh, and it's exactly what you're saying. The feeling was indescribable. I've never felt something like it, not even, you know, well, I mean, it's just different, but seeing Sandra Bullock as Mallory was a whole different kind of like, <laughs> But like that feeling of like, there's just nothing like it. And it's exactly what you said. You don't even, part of you doesn't even really give a shit what happens after that. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Like, yes, I can make this better now. And that, that was one of the beauties of handwriting it is that it forced the typed out rewrite. Because if you're going to enter it, you're not just going to enter it verbatim. You're going to make changes, right? So it forced the rewrite. But so it was like, okay, I'll make this better. Where's it going to get published? What do you mean? Who cares if it even gets published? Let's do another one and another one. And so my early run with all of this before Bird Box got um, picked up was, and Bird Box is included in this run, some nine, 10 novels or something, like when I met my agent and all that, that I never once tried to shop, never, ne did, uh, I guess I rewrote Wendy because it was handwritten, like I said, whatever. Um, but so the point is like, there was never a sense of what do I do with these? Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, at the time I was in a rock band, I still am. And we were playing our shows or playing our songs every night in a different city, right? So there's some artistic gratification there. Like we were, um, I, I didn't have to find that in the books, 
that I was writing. And we weren't making money in the band. We started to maybe at the very end in a, in a, in a better way, but not like, you know, not where we're like, oh, we're retired. Or, you know, I mean, it was, I just, for some reason, I never saw the books with this urgency, with dollar signs in my eyes, these kind of things. It just seemed like them being finished was enough. And now I have in the crate behind you, behind the screen, <laughs> um, there's 33 rough drafts in there of novels. Nine wow. of them are out in the world. Well, yeah, nine of them are out in the world. And I still feel the same way right now, despite Mallory going through rewrites and movie for Bird Box and movie for Our House of the Head. And I still feel like those 33 novels, that, that's, that's it right there. That's the stuff. And it's the same thing that you were saying, like you almost don't even care what, it, you do care, you want them to do well. And I couldn't, believe me, I could not be more grateful than I am for every single thing happening with all this. But ultimately that's the stuff. Mm. Yeah. There's so much, there's so much I really want to dig into. And I'm, I'm conscious obviously like time restraints and stuff, but like, I think there's such a, there seems to be such a purity around you and your process. I mean, to have a number of novels written that obviously I think everyone who writes a book wants some kind of success in some way and to obviously be picked up. But like you say, you had your gratification artistically with, with your band. So mm -hmm. what was it specifically that, that dragged you into writing, even though you were expressing yourself in, in other ways? So me and the um, other songwriter, Mark. So Mark Owen and I are the two songwriters in the High Strong. And we, we were always talking about, we want to write. And we wrote, so we got found love with songwriting together. We, we learned how to play guitars together, all this stuff. But all the while we were talking about how we wanted to write books, constantly talking about it and even tried experiments to force ourselves to where we would <clears throat> come home from work on a Friday. We lived together, lock the door and you weren't allowed to leave till uh, Monday with a completed story. Like you Amazing. literally were not allowed to leave the apartment. <laughs> Sorry, like stuff like that. So we would, you would bring home like, f like sandwiches and whiskey, you know, and you're like, oh, we're not leaving, you know, <laughs> but I was writing <clears throat> like poems which and that's really a loose word for what they, I mean, whatever those, those are embarrassing, but like emo <laughs> poems and short stories trying to before writing songs. So even like from the word go, it's always been like trying to write in some fashion or another. But then it was really when I met Mark and when we started writing songs together and then you start putting out albums, right? That you start to see like, if we can put out an album, why can't this novel idea be, realistic why can't this happen and i mean i remember reading that ken kesey had written all of cuckoo's nest and then when he was done he was like oh man what if this was told from the from chief's perspective instead and then he started over and wrote it again and i thought when i read that it sounded like someone said they ran five marathons in a row like i couldn't <laughs> comprehend what i had just read i'm like what do you mean he wrote a whole novel and then wrote it again from a no I couldn't grasp it. And then with Bird Box, there were, you know, it gets picked up. Uh, the rough draft was really a wild, a wild incarnation of that book. But anyway, um, it gets picked up and there were enough notes um, that had to do with, uh, the rough draft had like 14 housemates and the final book had like seven. There were enough notes that suggested either you remove characters and pretend this other character set himself or you just write this stuff from scratch and you know how it is. So. I did the same exact thing. Bird Box got picked up and I saw the notes that they had and just really in terms of limiting the characters. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna write it again. I'm not gonna sit here and try to squeeze every chapter to like, you know, change the names and change it a little. Does that sound like, let's just try it again. And that was a real eye-opening experience for me of how, well, I guess I would call it, um, you're in writing shape. Right. So if you're not finishing novels, if you're not writing regularly, the idea, the concept of writing the same novel twice is bonkers. Yes. But if you are and if you're doing it every day and you're working on it and you're rewriting and you're working on another idea, it's, it's not all of a sudden. So that had, that's another that's another thing, because I feel like we, we're sort of now satellite um, satelliting um, what makes an artist. Right. Mm -hmm. And there is and there is being in art an artist like shape for it well you that that can mean that you get wasted every night and paint you know <laughs> every night or whatever that, you know it's not the same as being on the treadmill but there is a certain like artistic muscle that has to be in shape or something as well absolutely 
I will also state just for listeners, if you do hear some thumping in the background, it's my next door neighbors and I'm not Edgar Allan Poeing and having someone just dead beneath, just a heart beating beneath my floorboards. Like, I was going to ask, I was going to be like, hmm, hmm, there's someone that shut up for them. Um, Did you want to come rid of the floorboards? Yes, and carpeted over. <laughs> I'll move the camera, I'll show people just to, just to be sure. Um, but obviously you mentioned there about the, the first draft of, of Bird Box and from what I've read, and if this is accurate, that was a whirlwind 26 day sprint similarly to your experiment with Wendy in which that was handwritten and that was just in one go. Bird Box was 26 days, mostly italics, barely any dialogue tags and with five flinches, finches flying above your head. You seem to have this knack for creating unique situations in which to write those first drafts. Is that something that you deliberately set up or does it just kind of happen in that way for you? I have never thought about that before. And the first thing that comes to mind is Carpenter's Farm was written live on at the beginning of this pandemic. I don't know if you know of that one. I, I, I posted it to the website in installments. Um, that would be a real example of what you just asked, like like making a <laughs> like the, the writing of the rough draft being in extraordinary <laughs> circumstances. Believe you me, there are easier things than writing a novel live. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. But but um but yeah, I do feel like that. Like Goblin had had a had a, that to it. Unbury Carroll was a super. Few. I wrote Unbury Carroll was the fastest I've ever written a novel, and it, it is it's my favorite one. Um, which that always sounds weird when an author says that, but I don't care. It is my favorite <laughs> one. It it was. I think I wrote Unbury Carroll in fifteen days, and wow. the rough draft was like almost ninety. Th- it was like fifty three hundred words a day from day one. I mean, from day one, like. Boom, usually it's like day one's like 500, 1,000. You're like, all right, I introduced Jonathan or something. And then day two, you're like, okay, now he has brown hair. And <laughs> you're like starting to build up, you know? And mm-hmm. then you're rolling by the end. I'm very careful from the, from the minute the gate opened was just an explosion. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I do, and, and again, this, it just all keeps circling the first question, which I love. Um, because... If we are saying that the rough draft is what matters, right? Or, or, or the finishing of the rough draft, putting the end on the book, right? Well, shouldn't that experience, or, or isn't it nice if that experience is joyful? Isn't it nice if that experience is a rush? If, if it's out of body, if it's transcendent, if you're like into it, you know, like you're like jamming or something, like stone without being stone. I can't imagine writing a book stone, by the way. That would be the worst thing. <laughs> but, but like, so like, those and that says something too like i'm saying you the good stuff's in that that trunk right there this huge crate it also is saying like the good experiences of like you're not caring about oh how right or not you're just like in this world and you're going for it so i do think i i would say this it's not intentional that the rough drafts have become sort of extraordinary experiences for me but it's also no secret to me that or it's no surprised to me that they have been because to me that's the most like joyful moment of the process yeah have any of your works been written over a longer period and with a bit more deliberation or are they all these kind of explosions of energy and an idea so there was two one is kind of like two explosions because i wrote um it's the two longest ones i've written so one it's called bring me the map that one i wrote eighty thousand fairly steadily and then i was i ran out of gas and a year later, I wrote the other, I wrote another 80,000, the second half of it. And I had never done that before where I took a break between, I wrote other stuff between, but I was like, all right, now it's time to go finish, bring me the map and did another 80,000. But the real one, the one time that I was steady about it and I have the book here and I almost want to show you, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I do want to show you because I, even though nobody can see this, I feel like you have to. So this it's called, I'm holding up a giant stack of paper, everyone. Wow. That, I mean, giant stack indeed, yes. It's called Ghoul in the Cape. That is a beast. Wow. Is that, is that like size 25 font? <laughs> yeah, yes, that's good. No, it's 1,100 pages. And I went into it knowing that it was going to be a giant. And so I said to myself, it was almost like counterintuitive or something, but I said to myself, okay, look, typically when you get rolling, you're doing at the least 2,500, 3,000 a day. And, and at the most, like Carol, like 5,300 a day. But with this one, I think if you're gonna get through this one, I think you gotta do like 1,000 a day and spend a year on this. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be like, it is, it's over 300,000. And I think that there was something that was like, 
that sounds counterintuitive. Oh, you're gonna write like your longest book ever. You're gonna take your time and write it slower. Well, the reason why is I, I just can't imagine maintaining that bird box or Carol pace for 1100 pages. Mm. And it freaking worked. Like the months are passing and the numbers start, you know, three months pass and you're at 90,000. You're like, I'm almost like a third of the way through this story. A couple more months, you're about halfway. You're like, this is freaking working. And so that's the one time that I took it in a steady, like intentionally, hey man, like don't, don't overextend yourself. And not to use sports analogies or whatever, but in the same way, if you're running every day, if you run 10 miles one day, you may not run the next day, right? Yes. And then if you don't run the next day, maybe you won't run the next day. So I'd rather have ran that one mile every day. And that's what Google in the Cape was. Mm. And that's such useful advice because a lot of my uh, listeners are people who are first time authors who are struggling to get those words down and to, to even think about writing something so large um, seems impossible. But if you can if you can nail just a thousand words a day or even just 500 words a day and chip away at it constantly then that's when you really build up that that body of work that you can then start to put out there and obviously even though you you've hit success with a lot of what you're doing and you're you're prolifically writing all these books you're still using that method to write these much much larger works which i find endlessly fascinating yeah so okay think about what you just said like 500 words a day it almost sounds like if you're rolling 500 words could, like literally could be like 15 20 minutes or mm. it could take time depends on how serious you are about those words and how, how how likely they are to remain, right? But the point is like, if you only did 500 a day, so okay, Google in the Cape is a thousand, that's 300,000. So let's say you did half that, 500 a day. I mean, in a year's time, by the way, less than, uh, it would be 10 months time, you would end up with like, like 550 page rough draft. And like, so I always think about that. I'm like, time is going to pass either way. Yes why not market with these sessions, these daily sessions? And when you turn around in 10 months, let's say, to the person starting today, I mean, can you, five, for doing almost nothing different, you write 500 words a day and you have 550 pages? And that all sounds a little clinical. That all sounds a little um, uh, strategic. Formulaic. Yeah, yeah. And then like, and I'm like, it, that's not where I'm coming from. It's really not. But sometimes numbers can help. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you're like, because a book just can sound so daunting, like it used to to me, like Kesey's thing. Like, it can sound so, oh my God, 300 pages, but you just do this little bit. I mean, and then here we are, Google in the Cape is a mammoth thing that is, by the way, uh, a special edition, this, this hasn't been announced anywhere yet. A special edition of this book is coming out. Um, I don't know when, I have to rewrite this <laughs> stack for him. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a four pages that i'll add as well when we said it's 1100 pages that's a four pages yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so he he's putting out like the full thousand page like edition and everything and it'll be like a thousand of them made or something and that's probably coming out like in a year and a half or something but i, I gotta still rewrite it for him but i had a long discussion and this is an interesting thing for writers to hear too that there are different kinds of rewrites depending on the book itself and this is the same with music i like and me and the publisher both like that google in the cape is loose that it's that it meanders that it has that, that it breathes that you know bird box is a bullet yes. story like a they can't like boom like everything is united one note story that this one's not like that so with bird box the rewrite could in effect take longer than like an, a thousand page book that you're mostly just all right, okay, uh, he used to be called John, now you're calling him Jim, that's a <laughs> bad, you know, like a lot of that kind of stuff happens. Like, wait, I, you haven't mentioned his sister in like 500 pages, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's gonna be like a gentle sort of a just read through, make sure it's all together. Whereas the rewrite of the newest book uh, I wrote for Del Rey, that one will be like a detailed every every kind of beat thing. And that's interesting too. Like not all, not all rewrites are, uh, are the same. Mm. And all of this links me very, very nicely to another point that I wanted to hit, which I love it when this happens in an interview and you circle around something that's going to come up anyway. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a minute while I read some of your words back at you, because uh, as I said, just before we started recording, I've recently finished uh, Mallory, which was a fantastic follow up to Bird Box, which um, I will also add right now that I think Bird Box was the first book in a long time, which refueled my, my love of reading. And I read it back in it was 2018, so obviously a few years after it was published, but I'd seen it floating around a lot, and it was one of those I kept seeing pop up. 
And then it became part of a readers group that I'm involved in. And it was one book that I I blitzed through in two days while I was traveling around to see friends in sort of Manchester and other places. And I I just couldn't put it down. And that hasn't happened to me in quite a few years. It's not because other books are, are terrible, not at all. Like I've enjoyed books that I've read, but it's been a while since one has really sort of like just grabbed me and pulled me in. So having recently read Mallory and seeing that you've managed to deliver that twice I think number one that's a, a, a sensational thing so I, I highly applaud you on on everything you've done there man thank you um I thank you so much for for all that I um real fast I wanted to say about that like you know at first talking to Del Rey and my agent about doing Mallory um and we can get to that deeper if you want later or mm. something but I when I sat down to write it, I was like, okay, here we go. And the minute it started, it was like, oh, I, like any pressure or anything was just gone. Mm. It was like, I'm just happy to be with Mallory again. Like, there's just some characters that come around, I think, for authors that, how do you explain it? Like, there's no, oh, remember, she would be like this, or she would, yes. you know, she would. It's just like, naturally, this, I, I know her. I got her. I got her. I know her. Yeah. It's got to be such a nice feeling. And uh, I definitely want to get to some of that stuff. But I will say for listeners, if we don't get more to some of the, the Bird Box Mallory stuff, um, you did do a fantastic interview on the This Is Horror podcast. And Michael David Wilson is a good friend of ours. And he was on the show recently. So I'll definitely link to, I think you did three episodes sort of in, in sequence that you put up there. So if people want yeah. to find out more about that, it's definitely in there. I'll link to that. Um, I love you guys. No worries. Uh, but yeah, at the end of Mallory, you you wrote a little afterward. And as I was reading through it, there was some part that really, really pulled me in. And I'm, I'll am i read this full paragraph and then we can kind of discuss, but it is quite long. So it's, like I say, please do indulge me. What the prolific understands deeply is that you can start anywhere in a prolific's catalogue and work your way in either direction from there. What the prolific cherishes about all things is not the singular work of art, but the canon, the oeuvre, the arc of a creative mind unable to stop itself the waves created by endless ideas. Have I mentioned that the prolific believes anything he or she does at any time is a snapshot of the whole? That to wait years between projects is akin to having misplaced a thousand photographs from an era that, in hindsight, was much cooler than it felt at the time. Now, for me, that clicked on so many levels because I'm known more within the indie community as someone that writes very, very fast. So I I put out a lot of product in, in different places. And for me, I was getting into a position in which well, number one, I do want to slow down a little bit and focus more sort of and, and go a bit more deeper into projects because I feel like personally I'm writing a bit too fast, but that's a whole different conversation. But to read something like this and to know that there are other people out there that feel that sense of urgency to create something that captures a moment in time and doesn't feel the pressure of a book needing to be a, a perfect um, monument of, of who a person is, that it's, it's shifting, it's changing, it's morphing as time goes by. Um, I mean... I, I know that when I interviewed Jonathan Jazz, he came, he, he mentioned a few times about the the art of the prolific, but talk to us a little bit more about that idea and how you feel about that, because it's something I've never seen so um, succinctly put and so so eloquently put as, as you have. Man, um, I... We're getting deep here. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, this is, again, this, these are like my favorite subjects. So I have a friend's friends, numerous friends that have book ideas and then I see them getting stuck and I keep, you know, I keep going back to the moment I finished a first book, which was, like I said, there was the, there was the lofty idea that I, that I was like, this is the one I'm trying to write. And then the crazy horror story that I was like, this will help me write that one essentially. Left the lofty one behind and went nuts into this one. And, and I see friends that are stuck on their first novel. And I start to feel like I have a feeling that you think that that novel has to represent you in full. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's going on here. Every character, every street name has to represent you in full. And what you don't realize, and you can't know if you're prolific or not until book two, right? I mean, you can't, if you only wrote one, you don't know until you write that second one, like what you're capable of in that way, right? But the minute you do have that second book, then you start to realize, okay, Wendy was more about um, sexuality. Goblin was more about um, like, a, like a character, like sketches or whatever. And that was the second book I wrote, Goblin. The Wolverine line, um, oh, I love that book. That's the third book I wrote. The Wolverine line was uh, just a spiral into um, a guy that was just whatever, like horribly afraid of an experience that happened to him. And so, so it was like all these different things already in the first three books 
And I started to realize that any spotlight on what I was trying to, uh, or what I'm trying to say or represent or whatever is already divvied up now amongst three books. So to understand, you know, where he or she is coming from, and in this case, me, you, Wendy wouldn't represent me in full, neither would Bird Box. In fact, it's, sometimes it's incredible to me that Bird Box is the breakthrough one because it's sort of the flattest one. It's like the straightest one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like a super scatterbrained, like, like Carol is much more like my personality, like, 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 going from like vignette scene to scene, like multiple characters and bizarre setting and bizarre circumstances. But so, okay, now if you put Bird Box and Carol next to each other, someone might not even, without my name, I don't, I don't think somebody would recognize those as the same author. I don't think so. And so, and I think you could even do that with inspection. And then it'd be like, I have no, like these are three different people. But what that means to me is that a single work of art isn't what represents you it's the canon that you just uh, read. And then, but the beauty of that is the second you embrace that and the second you really live by that, well then, then shit, man, anything goes. Like, because now you're saying you could literally write a novel where not a single character agrees with any way you see the world at all. Like you don't have to, it's almost like, okay, so there's that element, the dispersed spotlight, right? Or numerous spotlights or whatever it is but removing the spotlight from one work of art. But then there's also like the sense that like the novel on like a rock band, there's nowhere to hide, okay? So, so my friend who's worried about representing himself in full in a novel, well, guess what? You're going to, like you can't hide in a novel anyway. Like if you and I were given the same exact scenario, um, literally the sun comes up, uh, Jonathan wakes up, he goes to the bathroom, he goes downstairs, just already how you tell that and I tell that, like we're worlds apart already, and the same exact moment happened. There's just no hiding it. And you, and, and, and if you, even to the point where if you did write a novel that was, um, uh, what's the right word, unlike yourself or unlike your worldviews, that would probably be understood by someone reading it that either this was a farce or sarcastic or irony or something would be understood there because the real you is impossible to hide in a novel. And so that might sound like scary to someone, but what it should do is lift the pressure of feeling like you have to figure out a way to express yourself. By writing at all, you are expressing yourself. I remember before a show that the High Strung had in Chicago, there was a, a poet named Fax Douglas who liked to read his poems on stage before the band would play. And he's legendary around Chicago. He would do this for, uh, what do they call Wilco and other bands. And, and he did it for the High Strung. And I remember talking to Fax and I was like, I don't think I, had I written? Yeah, I had already written a couple books by then. And I was like, I wanna write the great, like optimistic, like the optimist novel that, that years from now, if somebody was like, oh, you, you need to read Mallerman's blah, 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 if you're, if you're wondering how to, you know, get through this moment or something. And Fax turned to me and he goes, isn't the act of writing at all optimistic? And I was like, yeah, shit, you're right, you're right. <laughs> He's like, because doesn't it imply that it matters? And doesn't it imply that someone might read it? And doesn't it imply that there's meaning? And I'm like, yeah, thank you. Now I'm just going to keep doing what I was doing and let it let that all work itself out. So yes, 100%. Um, I think that the ultimate beauty of the prolific is it ends up becoming the canon, the quilt, the body of work ends up representing you rather than just Bird Box, just Unbury Carol. Hmm. One thing that I found in terms of sort of researching you and just in previous conversations I've had with other writers is your name is often uh, brought up into conversation as a very positive influence and someone who manages to remain humble despite obviously this, this global success that you've had with, with your films, with your books and everything else. Um, I, the question I'm going to ask is kind of two part. Number one, how do you stay so humble once you have received this kind of attention in this industry? And number two, you seem to be a very active force in terms of holding a hand back to help people behind you on the journey come up as well. So wh what does that look like for you? How, how, how do you think about helping the others behind you and how do you manage to sort of stay so, so grounded and humble? Man, those, th those are hard ones to, to dissect myself, I feel like one answer I have is is, is that um, 
is the same way that you're approaching it too, where if it's all, if you're all coming from uh, a place of joy and love for writing and for books, then I mean, like if you, if you it, it almost comes down to again, that the real meat of the matter is in the rough draft. So anything that happens beyond that is like, oh my God, this is wonderful, this kind of thing. But I think, I do wonder though, if I was 20 years old, when Bird Box comes out and a movie is made and it's a hit movie, what would I, what would I be like by 23, mm. 24? I don't know. I can't say for sure that I would be this, you know, I would probably walk around like I fucking own the city or something. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, everything I write is gonna be turned into like Sandra Bullock's and stuff and everything. <laughs> like I probably wouldn't, I probably would have no real concept. I mean, maybe I'm not giving myself enough credit, but because I do think that most people I've met are coming from the right place, especially like authors, right? I mean, how many authors have you really met where they're like, my goal is to be world famous or my goal is to make a million dollars, you know? And while we all want these things to happen, and it seems like that kind of attitude can really help someone in say sports, you know? Mm. They give them some sort of like energized edge or something like some chip on your shoulder or something like that. But I kind of have a rule, no V's in art, no validation. Oh, oh, meaning by um, success. So mm. Bird Box doing well should not validate the other books or, or me or some career, should not um, uh, be a victory. The writing in it itself is the victory. Um, should not, um, um, oh, nothing vengeful. If anybody ever said like something about you and you're like, well, now what do you think, motherfucker? You know, like, no, 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 no. Hold that back. I've met those people. Yeah, right. And but some of the, and then there's one more, but I can't remember the fourth V right now. It, it's in the newest book that I wrote, the four Vs. Um, but but the point is like, I, I'm very aware at 40, like, like or 40 something, like be like, you know, let's not look at the success of Bird Box as it means, you know, um, uh, there's no spite in that. There's no bad feeling. You're not, you're not wishing, you know, you're not glad that this happened that someone else sees you, you know, succeed. Like, no, 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 no. The joy, everything is in that rough draft. Anything that happens on top of that, just be grateful for. Literally everything that happens on top of that rough draft, just be grateful for. And so if that sounds humble, then I guess I am. And in terms of, um, so I don't mean because I have a feeling you don't think this way either, but I don't. I just don't see it as reaching behind or down to like help someone that kind of thing. And like I see sometimes online, someone will say, "Oh, I only, I only punch up," or "I'll never punch down." <laughs> and I'm like, "What? What the fuck is up and down anyway, man? Mm. Like what? Because this guy sold more books than you, or this guy sold less, or whatever. The guy Dean Koontz might be the coolest, most sensitive, nicest dude in the world. I have no idea. You know, <laughs> if, if, if I punched up at Dean Koontz, is it? Oh, that's okay. And then for all I know, he could send him into a mental spiral for six weeks. <laughs> you read that? You know what I mean? Whereas someone else that I was like, I'm not gonna punch down, or y'all never mm. punch down. This guy could be the biggest turd burglar in the world. So I don't know. So I don't, I just don't see it as behind, forward, up, down, like to begin with. I just don't. Sometimes I do worry because I see like, um, what's the right phrase? I do see like people on Twitter that, and, and online that sort of present themselves as a little more aloof, hmm. you know, certain like writers, not, not distance from other writers, but just, they just seem a little more aloof or a little more, I don't know how to explain it. Whereas I feel like on, on, on online, I'm just like exactly like I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. Sometimes I worry like, is that, you know, am I going to ruin any chance of mystique or is that already like ruined <laughs> years ago? <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely comes across. There's definitely transparency when it comes to just the things that I've read about you, obviously other podcasts I've listened to speaking to you now. Um, it's all sort of one just authentic experience. Right. We, we would be doing a bit of a disservice if we don't touch on Bird Box and Mallory. And uh, I guess one question that I have from my side is obviously Bird Box was originally published, if my facts are correct, in 2014. The movie with Sandra Bullock, which, by the way, was fantastic, uh, came out in 2018 and Mallory has come out this year. How have you kept the momentum flowing between these different projects as they go on? Because obviously it's one overall, it's one large story and people are still invested and they love it and they love what you're bringing. Are you actively doing anything from your side to keep that momentum going? You mean to keep the momentum? Some of the Bird Box or the Bird Box story through the, or do you mean uh, writing in general? You mean um, the bird box story, right? Yeah, more than the story, yeah. Yeah, like like that world or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
Dude, to make matters even weirder, the rough draft was written in 06. So the real question is like, how the hell? <laughs> <laughs> like have you because to me and I, i'll say this a million times they're all the same to me you know i love them all so i'm like how the hell is this one me like woo like you know i think here's the answer okay bird box gets picked up comes out in 2014 and and did like what i thought was really fun and well in his first week right but by like New York Times bestseller standards or really even by any major publisher standards, it was probably a disappointment when it first came out in terms of sales. I'm sure that it, it would have been whatever. The point is the second week it was did about the same, the third week about the same, the fourth week the same until now we're talking a whole year of, of that. And then it became like, huh, wait, this is becoming interesting because Bird Box didn't sell like thousands of copies in his first two weeks and then sort of peter out or whatever. It's literally had this steady this to it for an entire year um the first week to to the last week and then that year became two years and that year became three those two became three and then four and all of a sudden it was like kind of a strange thing that me and my agent would talk about regularly like man it's it's still doing exactly like it did it never rose above a certain volume and it never went below a certain volume it just stayed at this steady hum for like four years. And I can only, I attribute that to, you know, I see Bird Box on a lot of lists of like horror novels to read. And um, and also I think that Bird Box could, um, like it's one of those horror novels that can step outside of the genre a little. Like to me, it's squarely horror, but it could step outside. It could be, uh, uh, Bird Box could go to a thriller party, you know? I can see Bird Box drinking with like a thriller. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's gonna it's gonna go home to the horror house, but but it can go out for a night, you know. <laughs> so I, think, I think that like a one night pass. Yeah, yeah, it's a one night stand, and the you know <laughs> you know, doesn't spend much time in the romantic comedy side of town, but I'm sure that she'd be welcome there too. Um, so then, I think that has something to do with it. It's a little bit outside the genre, and it was a word of mouth, and the horror scene like really propelled it. And for me. It was this incredible thing because I went to StokerCon in 2000. So the book wasn't out yet. I think it was 2000. It was right before it came out in 2014. I had never met anybody in the scene yet at all. I don't have a book out yet, but I had a box of 60 hard copies, hard covers of a bird box that I was supposed to sell. And I mean, that you can make some good money off that if you think about it, right? Uh, 10 to, between 10 and 20 for each of these and set up a table and and I'm looking at all these like tables set up. I don't know a single person there. I'm like, oh, how am I going to sell these, man? So I was like, you know what? Forget it. You just don't even think about the money. And I just stood up and put up a sign saying free hardcovers. And all these people would walk up and then I would all of a sudden talking to them about Bird Box and they write books too. And maybe they would give me one of theirs or whatever. And I met like 50, 60 people in like the horror world in that like hour that and I, I always cite that as one of the best decisions I ever made and, I, and I'm not saying to an author like give yourself away for free <laughs> it just seemed like in that moment it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. and and I always think that there was some sort of seed work that happened there because the um at the time the head of the HWA Rocky Wood he was one of the people that got one and he posted about it being a great debut and that led to more people reading it, it just seemed like there was a steady flow to it and then now a couple couple that with the fact that there were announcements along the way, right? Netflix bought Universal Option Bird Box before it came out. Netflix bought the rights to Bird Box from Universal. That's an announcement. Sandra Bullock gets on board six months later or whatever. That's an announcement. Sarah Paulson's on board. John Malkovich, like, um, is directed by Suzanne Beer, who did this. So there was, like, regular things to talk about mm -hmm. in the course between from book to film. It wasn't, like, the book is uh, made and a month later there's a movie and now what do we talk about? It, there was this steady flow of like exciting advancements on the movie side and then the movie thing happened and that was just, I mean, that's a whole hour long conversation in and of itself. Yes. And at that point, that's just set up for Mallory to come out. So I think that it, the, the answer to your question, how do you maintain that is steady word of mouth, things to talk about and that Bird Box maybe maybe not transcends but steps out of the genre a little bit too mm. we are unfortunately getting very close to time but i do have one main question before we go into a couple of patreon questions 
And uh, that question is the same one that I ask every guest that comes on the show, which is, why do you, Josh Malaman, write? Now, Jonathan yeah. Jantz had a very good answer, so hopefully you can top it. <laughs> I, it. I don't know. I mean, for me, it, it, it's like, it's such a thrill. It's so, I don't want to use the word fun, because it's so much more than just fun. Um, it's such a thrill. It's, it's. I don't, I don't know. I, I had one time where, um, a, you know, where I was like drinking a lot with a bunch of drinking buddies. One time I asked, but anyway, they're in the middle of a real <laughs> run. I was in the middle of a real run for there. And then, and then I, there was a bar we all hung out at and, the, and this girl showed up um, in the middle of the day to literally came to talk to me about maybe, and I was like 30 something at the time that maybe I needed a plan B. And she's like, listen, like you're having the time of your life you know, you're writing the, God, I see online that you've written like 10 books or whatever. It was before Bird Box gets picked up and all that. And I'm like, and she's like, I think, I think you need a plan B. I mean, at some point you have to think like you're bro one of the brokest people I've ever met. Like, what are you going to do? And the question was so bizarre to me, man, that I, it wasn't like, I didn't even get upset about it. It was so weird to me. It sounded like she could have been asking me like, you're like, you know, I think that you need a third foot or, or, <laughs> or I borrow one of your eyes. You know, I was like, I literally didn't understand what she meant. What do you mean? Like plan B? Like, this is, this is what I do. This is like, that. I'm going to write another one and another one, another one. And then Bird Box got picked up. And I, I can say with absolute certainty that if without Harper Collins, Del, uh, Del Rey, the movie, all that, I would be at 33 books now still. I was doing about two a year before all this happened and I'm still at about two a year since then, since it's happened. So why do you write? I mean, I, it's, there's no intentional, I'm going to say this, but it's like, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's the most thrilling, joyous. It's like the place that I have, the, I have the most, it's the most colorful place that I go to. Fantastic, beautifully put. Uh, we're going to just ask, I think we've got time for one question from our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share. And I'm going to go with Faye Trask, who says, how much say did you have when it came to turning Bird Box into a movie? Did you get to do anything neat, like meet the actors or visit the set? Oh, yeah. So, okay, in terms of say, none. And and and, and that, think about it. Bird Box was optioned before it came out. It's my first book. So talk about no leverage. I mean, I literally had nothing out in the world yet. Um, so we happily, joyfully said, take it away and do whatever you want with it. That said, we were welcome. I was welcome um, into like the first initial conversations with who the screenwriter was going to be. Um, we, I was, I flew out to LA and went onto the set to meet the producers and they showed me storyboards. Um, they would give us like updates and we were welcome on set. And um, we, Allison and I, you know, watched a, a scene shot out in the woods. And then we watched the majority of the, or a, a large chunk of the day was in like a sound studio, like on the Warner Brothers lot, like just so you, like you'd see in the movie, like where Pee Wee was riding his bike around, you know, that kind of stuff. And like, we're in one of those studios watching the scene where the car flips, you know? Mm. So Sandra Bullock and Sarah Paulson are like in the car, like, and then they, you know, it comes back and then it comes back and it comes back. It's all in this like, oops, this like contraption, this machine. And at the end of that um, day, Okay, real fast. So where they filmed, was like, <laughs> where they filmed was all like lit up, you know, and and it was all like sort of shadows beyond that. And at the end of the day, we were there for hours. The one of the main producers was like, "Hey, Josh, I want, I want you to meet someone." And I'm like, "Oh shit, I'm about to meet Sandra Bullock." I'm like so nervous, you know. And he like led me through a bunch of people and walked me out under those lights. And everyone else, more or less, you know, sort of like was back in the shadowy area. And I was like meeting her under the bright lights of a stage. And she's like a full makeup and costume for the role. And I'm like, oh. Mallory. I'm like, what is going on right now? I'm meeting Sandra Bullock like, like, like she has her own spotlight or something, mm. you know? Like, yeah, it was an amazing moment. And then we were invited to the LA premiere. Um, and this was actually kind of a big moment for me because the LA premiere, well, that, that was a huge moment for me, but the LA premiere was, in the contract actually, like Josh gets to go to the premiere, right? And then Alice and I had the time of our lives that night. Oh my God, just even thinking about it now. And then after that, they invited us to the New York one and that one wasn't in the contract. And it really meant something to me. I was like, oh my God, they're like, we added to that party. Well, which we do, Alice and I definitely are adders. 
but like, but I was like, we're definitely not subtractors. And I was like, we added to that, you know, to their party and they liked us and they went. So that was a huge sort of moment. So did I have any say? No, I also didn't care about that. In the same way with my band, I'm the songwriter. I bring a song, I don't tell Derek what's play. I wrote the song Bird Box and let, they just played it however they wanted. Great, done. Amazing, I love that. Okay, so we're gonna go into a quick fire round now, which is 10 questions I'm gonna throw at you as quickly as possible. At any point, feel free to pass. Otherwise, just go with whatever answer comes first. And uh, if you're happy, I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Okay. Bram Stoker or Mary Shelley? Say, oh, wait, say it again. Bram Stoker or Mary Shelley? Oh, man, 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 man. Mary okay. Shelley. What's your go-to breakfast? Uh, eggs. If you could sentence one person to live in their own personal quarantine for the next year, just to free the rest of the world, who would it be? I mean, alternatively, that... or go on, sorry. Say, say it again. I was going to say, alternatively, if you don't want to answer that, would you live in your own personal quarantine for one year just to free the rest of the world? <laughs> I think the answer to this one is too obvious. <laughs> and there's a very, I, I do have someone in mind that should go in quarantine for a year, or maybe 50. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go implied. Uh, the Beatles or The Who? Oh, man, The Who. Who's your go-to author to get you out of a writing funk? <sighs> Recently, it was Philip Roth. What one musician, living or dead, would you invite into your hot tub? <laughs> no, but it sounds really weird. But I feel like my answer is Neil Young, but that sounds like the weirdest person. <laughs> but I have so many questions for him about his songwriting, I guess Neil <laughs> Be This is the best situation to answer those questions, just weirdly naked in a hot tub. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> if a random fire destroyed all of your work and you were only able to save one story, which story would you save? Oh, Oh my God. Ooh, that's the scariest question I've ever been asked mm. in my life. One story. Oh boy. Um, uh, ooh. It's, it's, it's a novel called Pest. What's your party trick? My party trick? Mm. Um, I can drink this drink in half. <laughs> <laughs> What's one Chris Christmas present you wished you got, but you never received? Um, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, no, I did get that. Uh, I was about to say that I wanted the um, Constructicons. Um, I would like, uh, uh, man, I pass. That's a stumper. Uh, yeah. If you could have one sentence, word, or phrase published on a billboard and viewed by millions, what would it say? Um, so that is a really, man, these, this is not rapid fire stuff anymore. Now, now we've mentioned like really good questions. Um, something to the effect of um, get rid of the words good or bad. I love it. And that is 10 questions. One bonus that question. That was one bonus question. Where can my listeners find out everything about yourself and all that you're working on? Uh, everything is just uh, Josh Mallerman. So on Instagram, and there's only one L in Mallerman, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and also joshmallerman.com used to sort of be not that exciting necessarily, just updates, but now there's a free novel up there that I wrote live uh, in front of people during the beginning of this pandemic. Um, Carpenter's Farm is up there in its entirety. And one of my favorite things about that, there are no view numbers, reviews. Well, there are, might be reviews on Goodreads or something. No view numbers, no likes, no dislikes, no comments. It's literally just the book and chapters up there. And, and there's something very pure about that to me. Mm, absolutely love that. So yeah, if you're listening, absolutely check out anything that Josh has worked on. You'll be doing yourself a favor. And Josh, thank you so much for donating some of your time and coming to the show. It's been a genuine pleasure. Yeah, same. That was incredible. Now, now all I'm thinking about is that Christmas present, even though I'm Jewish, by the way. Then maybe that's why I passed. <laughs> there you go. I never, I never really had that moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do think of anything, throw it over and I'll pop it in the show notes. But okay. for now, thanks again for joining me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And I will see you next week. So there it is. Did I not promise you wonderful golden nuggets of beautiful author wisdom? like that that that's all i can add to it um so we'll leave it there for this week as i say we should be back to regular programming next week we'll give you any notice if there isn't uh, and just quickly for anyone that has stuck around to the end did forget to say in the intro as well um 
check out my latest interview on uh, the Creative Pen podcast, where I was, after nine years of working at this author business, I was finally invited onto Joanna Penn's wonderful podcast, where I chatted all about my journey, all about mindset, all about productivity in a healthy way, and all the things that I bring to Activated Authors has been represented over on the Joanna Penn Creative Pen podcast. Go check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes. But for now, I will say a massive thank you to you, the listeners, for tuning in. We appreciate you and the time you choose to spend with us each and every week. And as always, if you're looking to level up your writing and activate your author career, head on over to activatedauthors.com to find out all about our community, our resources, and everything else that we've got going on. One more time from myself. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Activate your energy. Thanks for listening to the Activated Authors Podcast. If you're ready to unlock your true potential and activate your author career, then head on over to www.activatedauthors.com to find out more.